All right, so now we have it ready uh, for our first test. Now I've gone above and beyond, and I've actually installed the controls. The controls, uh, Walter, that I was going to let you install, I've installed them because the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I know exactly how these things go together. And so I might as well do it for you so that uh, there's not confusion half a world away, half a planet away. And we haven't even discussed the absolute necessity for the manual track adjustment mechanism. And so I thought, well, that one's more complicated. Um, even though I provide a schematic on my video for the, uh, for the manual track adjustment edition, I might as well just build it. And that way I can test it before ever shipping it to you. So what I've done is this lower portion here that used to house um, the formatter board. Because the Universal QIC tape reader is format agnostic, meaning it uses it, it doesn't look for any format at all. It just outputs the data pulses as they are. The QIC 36 interface is very, very good for that. Um, that's why we're using a, Q, uh, a WangTech with a QIC 36 user interface. We're using a WangTech instead of an archive uh, because the WangTech provides a nice, clean signal. This circuitry is superior, I'm finding, uh, even though I don't know exactly why or how it is. And so even though it's more rare, you get this. And QIC 36 interface is the dumb interface. Uh, very little intelligence, and that's exactly what we want. We want to be doing all the manual control with these switches and knobs. So let's go through this. Now, um, as you've seen on my Universal QIC reader, the one on the big board, it's a little bit easier to see, but I basically have the six switches. So this one here is go, and I realize you're seeing it from the top, and there's a reason for that, but we'll, we'll show you it from the front side later. Go, reverse, and then from this order, track, uh, not track, but um, let's see here. There we go, pin assignments. So this is from one of my many, this is from one of my many um, WangTech manuals or tape drive manuals where the QIC36 user interface is explained plainly. I have, you know, about a dozen different manuals where it shows the QIC36 uh, interface. Even though it doesn't say QIC36 interface here, that's exactly what this is. Pins 2 through 50. This is the very standard QIC36 user interface. Okay, so 2 is go or stop. Up is go, bottom is stop. What I'm doing by going up, I'm just connecting, I'm connecting pin 2 to ground. Reverse. When it's up, it's going in reverse. When it's down, it's going forward. Again, connecting pin 4 to ground. And then track selector bit 0, 1, 2, and 3. So the way this is working, it's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12. This is exactly the same layout I have on my demonstration videos for my larger QIC, Universal QIC reader. Because here we have the various switches that you'll need to change in order to select the tracks. Track 0 through 8 according to the way the hard drive hardware assumes they're going to be. May not be where they actually are on the tape that you want to read uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One, you could have a different a format and a different form layout and two is alignment. Um, it could be a four track uh, format maybe even a two-track format, in which case those tracks may not line up. They might line up, but they might not. But you're always going to want to be able to do the fine-tuning with this manual track adjustment tool right here. And we'll go through that. <coughs> okay. But anyway, uh, pin 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12. And so uh, go stop, reverse forward, and track select. And it's not really obvious where this is 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's one, two, three, four, you know, something like that. You're going to have to, we're going to get you a grid, so we won't go through that now. Here I just want to do basic wiring so that you have an understanding of what's going on. So all of these are connected to, on this ribbon here, pins 2 through 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Now I looks, realize this looks a little bit like a rat's nest here. 
Um, but I did test, and this is the way the wiring is connected. Uh, this is pin one. It should be ground. And um, let's see, what else did I do on this user interface? I only connected two other two other wires. One is pin 26, which is the magic. Read pulse output. 26 is where the data comes from. So it's the one output this thing has. It only has one output. All of these are input configuration inputs. Just one output's all you need. Data pulse. And so this is pin 26. We have this connected with this red wire here right up to the logic analyzer, which I have already connected to the bottom part of the chassis with a double stick tape. So it's fixed solid. And all you should need is to get, um, is to get the, um, the USB and plug the USB in right here when we're ready. Let's see if we can find that here. Here's a good example. This one should work just fine. USB, it's this size. Of course, I'll be sending this, but it just fits right in here like that. Okay? And then this black wire is ground, and so we have uh, this connected to the ground pin here on the logic analyzer. And we're only using one channel on the logic analyzer, even though it accommodates eight. So we have this red wire plugged into channel one. That's all you're going to be using, channel one connected to uh, pin 26 read pulse output. That's all you're going to need for this stage anyway. Okay, now, um, for the rest of this, you, you, one of my videos shows how to do track alignment with an oscilloscope. And so you're ne going to, not only will you want to have the logic analyzer hooked up, you're going to want to have your oscilloscope hooked up. So the probe to your oscilloscope here, you will have that you see these two wires I have coming out the back? I have the red and the black. So the red is going to be your read data pulse. It's also connected to the same red wire right here. And I have this cap on here. So what you're going to do is this black one, you just pull this off. And what that does is it protects this pin, um, one from damage, but two, and most importantly, from being connected to anything. So let me zoom in here a little bit. So you can see a little bit closer what's going on. Okay. All right, so all you need to do is collect, connect your positive probe for your scope right to that. And your negative or ground to the black one. So it's this is going to be connected to the same thing as the logic analyzer. Now the logic analyzer will work connected to the scope. I've tested it, so unless your scope, you know, really dampens the signal, I think it's going to work just fine. And so that's why I left these two out the back, so that it's very convenient for you to do this. So I'm going to disconnect these right now. I did that just for demonstration. We haven't tested yet. I'm going to put these little caps back on. Uh, it helps if I get the right side, so watch that. Okay, and power. What do we need power for down here? Because, you know, this circuit, this is powered by USB, and everything else is powered by the tape drive. Well, now we're going to get to the part of this circuit. Now we're going to get to the, uh, the track alignment tool. So the track alignment tool is the more complex, and it is the one that uses these three relays down here. These are double pull, double throw relays. So in essence, what I've done is I've created a six pole double throw switch. And the reason we do that is because right here, this is this is the head this is the head alignment motor. This is exactly the same. I've taken one out of another one as this right here, okay? So this is a six connector plug that goes, that is, is supposed to, from the factory, go to this board, but it controls the head uh, alignment motor. This is the stepper motor that, can, that controls the head alignment, up and down, up and down, okay? So all this is, 
I'll show you here because I'm going to unplug it just so you can see. This, see how this is the same as this? See how those are identical? This goes around the board to the top to this motor right here. See those are, um, those are exactly the same, this motor right here. So, the male pins, they should fit only one way because um, one of these wires is, you know, the, the plug is plugged, so you can't put a pin in that one that doesn't have a wire connected to it. So in theory, you shouldn't be able to connect this backwards. Originally, this went directly to the board, but instead what we're doing is we have the board going to the relays, <laughs> then another connector from the relays going here. So what it's doing is all six of these connectors, when you hit this button right here, you push this momentary switch, and that's momentary on purpose. When you push this momentary switch right here, let me zoom out so we can see a little bit more on, on one screen here. When you push this momentary switch right here, and it's momentary for a reason, these relays close, and it switches control. It disconnects the board from the motor here, and instead it connects that, it connects the voltage to this rotary 12 position switch right here and this is this is designed so that when you turn this it turns the stepper motor clockwise for the dial is clockwise for the stepper motor and counterclockwise for the dial is counterclockwise for the stepper motor and this is somewhat logical to me at least because clockwise moves the head position up and counterclockwise moves the head position down. That's how the stepper motor is threaded, so that it works like that. And I find that fairly intuitive. The reason this is a, but, but you can't manually, you can spin this dial all day long, but you can't actually change the stepper motor until this button is pushed in, which closes these three double pull, double throw relays right here. Okay? And the reason for that is because I am, in order to get this, motor to move decisively, I'm putting more voltage in each coil than I think the circuit puts in it. And I think I'm going just a little bit beyond its long-term capacity. I'm putting 12 volts into every single coil, coil. That's a little bit overkill, but it really gets that thing to move, right? It doesn't miss, it doesn't miss a skip at all. And the problem is, if this were a switch that you could leave on by accident, after a minute, if you accidentally left 12 volts on one of the one of the tiny coils in here, I'm pretty sure it would overheat, overload, start to smoke, and you'd burn out the motor. So, you know, there's the caution, don't hold this in for a long period of time, but it's made so, so that you're only holding it in actively while you're turning this. That's the design that I came up with, and so far that's been extremely successful. So, hopefully this thing is 100% ready to go, for the most part, for you to put a tape in and connect your computer uh, after installing the Salie Logic Analyzer, grabbing a capture file, and then actually having the, mag the raw magnetic flux transitions off the tape that I can then uh, decipher for you with my programs and help you with. Okay, so let's put this thing together and see if we can actually do a test. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do that now. All right, we are ready for testing. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get our ATX power supply. Now this is just a standard ATX power supply uh, that came out of any average computer that was made in the last 20-30 years. I don't think it's one of the newest ones because one of the things it needs to have is these old style plugs, right? These right here. Definitely need to have those. If all you have are these or uh, the SATA plugs, you know, I don't know that that's going to necessarily be helpful. You'll have to get these plugs or figure out how to connect it some other way. Okay, but, and uh, these shouldn't be that hard to find. They aren't for me. I don't know if they are for you. But the way I get these to turn on, if they don't actually have a, um, if they don't actually have a switch here anywhere, uh, is uh, there's one green wire. I usually cut the green wire off of this plug because I'm not going to use it and then I cut a black wire off because they seem to all be ground and I connect the two and that is what turns the thing on that's the soft power I guess 
is what you call it the software con or the 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 um, uh, the circuit controlled power so it's not an actual switch okay so I uh, already have that on I'm gonna basically plug this in we're gonna have live power here alrighty yeah you know what I'm not gonna plug it in I'm gonna leave it unplugged here for a minute and I'm just gonna connect this up because I don't have a power switch on this the power switch would be well this over here so it's already connected don't have the power switch eh, let's do it that way yeah either way all right change my mind we'll plug it in okay so this is not on now it's on now it's not now it's on now it's not all right so we'll set these aside so they don't touch and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab one of these get the rest of these out of the way because they're just not going to be necessary at all I'm going to grab one of these right here and it's nice to have one with two of them it just works out because you're going to need to plug in two things the tape drive itself and then power to the lower board I'm sorry that I didn't integrate them I thought about hard soldering this to this but that has a whole other range of problems I want these to be able to be easily separatable these two these two layers here okay so all those switches are back off all right all right so let's plug in the bottom one first I don't think it really matters what the order is and get those pins aligned in there good and then the top one right here okay and this can go out of the way all right so now we have the top and the bottom plugged in and now we should be able to turn on our power supply and why not we'll twist the wires together and nothing should happen because there's no tape in so basically it should be energized with power but it shouldn't be doing anything because there's no tape now let's hope we don't see any sparks or let's hope this is uneventful so here we go all right that's good nothing happens so i'll twist these together put this out off the side hopefully it won't touch anything there we go well it's ground so I'm not that worried about it alright so now we do have this this light has gone on here and uh, that's all fun that's good I suppose that would be your power indicator right there is that that light has gone on this is actually the select light but I hardwired the selection I, I think I forgot saying that on the other video that um, um, drive select zero control pin 22 this is permanently grounded out and I permanently grounded that out on the ribbon beneath okay so now that you have that I would say we're ready to put in a tape and let's see what happens so here's my test tape I'll probably be sending this to you because there's just a very short file on it which is probably good for testing in addition to the uh, uh, the DC 300 uh, tapes you wanted. Okay, here we go. That's exactly what it should do. The head went all the way down to the base position and the, uh, the, the stepper motor makes that rattling sound. Basically it's hitting against the stop and it can't go any further but the way the circuitry works is uh, the circuitry in this thing works is it just turns the stepper motor so many times and it doesn't stop until the circuit is done turning it so if it hits that if if the stepper motor hits the end of the threads then the mechanism just ratchets it just goes that, 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 and doesn't go any further okay and if you're curious about that you should watch some of my other videos on the larger hardware that I built the one that's on a nice big flat board the first one you saw all right let's see here so now down here I should be hitting go now I wonder if um, let's try this we'll try putting this at a slight angle so that you can see the controls here a little bit underneath the tape that's in place so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to say go on and off and it should initialize the tape so here we go just initialize the tape position it basically goes back and forth the head moves up and down a little bit perfect it's exactly what it's supposed to do and so now we're just gonna test the the forward reverse controls 
forward, stop, reverse on, and I guess this isn't forward, this is go stop. Now it's in reverse, so it should go backwards. So we'll, we'll go backwards. And that's exactly what it did. And what I did is I went all the way back, all the way to the beginning of the tape, and thankfully the device is smart enough to know where the beginning and the end of the tape is so it doesn't keep going. Um, if you're using DC300A or DC300 tapes, they should have the upper lower tape holes, which this uses to determine that. You should have no problem there. Okay, so that being the case, let's turn this off. I did some tests earlier. Now we're going to look at this head alignment position. You, it's going to be a little bit harder to see, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on this. And what you're going to be looking at is this right here. You're going to be looking for some up-down motion right there. So, here's what we're going to do. This should be in the logical track zero place, where it assumes the default track zero is on the tape. May not be where the track zero is on your tape, but it's where it assumes it's going to be. So, this should produce no movement here whatsoever, and it doesn't. But this should produce a lot of movement. It should move it all the way down. This is basically going from track zero to track eight. So watch this move before the tape moves when I hit go. See that? It actually worked. Put it back in position, it goes back up, and it went back up again. One more time. That went down, and back up again. And you notice there was that little delay while it was moving. I'll, uh, I'll zoom on and out real close this time so that, that you really can see it. Right there, okay. So here we go. Track zero. Track eight. Yeah, now you can see it move. Back to track zero again. And I'm gonna go up to track three. And so basically track three is the highest it goes and track eight is the lowest. So we're gonna go from highest to lowest now. Okay, good. All that's fine and good. Back to track zero. And it's working. So we'll we'll um we'll zoom out a little bit. Okay. There we are. Now uh, let's hit reverse, put the tape back at the beginning. This is how we, re we rewind the tape. Just wait for it. Okay, good. Both switches off. I always turn the go stop off first before I make any changes. You don't have to, you can change these live, but you'll f when you play with it, you'll, you'll figure out how it works and it works just fine. Now, finally, I'm going to test the manual track adjustment here. And this is the first time for me to test that. So when I push in this button, I should hear the relays click. And I do, just like that. And when the, so right now, when I turn this, this shouldn't be changing at all, and it's not. All right, let me zoom in a little bit further here. All right. All right, so this is not moving at all. But when I hold this in, turning it clockwise should make it go up. So here we go. And it's moving up. Or this way, it should be moving down. There it goes. And it's all the way down. Yep, I see it moving the whole way. So it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. And that's all the way up and back down again. But then it stops turning. So watch my video for manual track alignment. Watch my video for manual track alignment and you'll see how that's working up and down okay so it is actually working now what I'm going to do is I'll uh, turn this on its side so that you can see it there well and it turns out that was it that was the extent of the range of the focus but 
that's okay. So we'll try this one more time. Again, holding in the button, turning the dial. You see how it's clockwise, it's raising the head. And counterclockwise, it's lowering the head, just like it's supposed to. And we should, see when I have the button out and I turn the dial, nothing happens. Push the button in, it moves. I should start clicking here soon. There it is, that click, see that click, and hear it? That's what you hear, that rattling when it, fir when the power, when it first powers on with the tape in, that's the stepper motor uh, ratcheting against this. So get very familiar with this, it's very important. Again, up a little bit and down. Okay, now, I'm going to take the tape out and put it back in again. We're going to initialize this because I want you to see how this works going to logical track zero. All right, all the way down, we'll hit go stop. Up, up some more, down, and this is where it thinks track zero is. Doesn't mean that's where your track zero is on any of your tapes. You may have to make changes here, up and down, ever so slightly. And let's now test the data pulse out with the oscilloscope. All right, we're moving on, I like this. Okay, let's go back to autofocus. There we are. So now, um, let's bring our oscilloscope into view here. Let's take this out, initialize this. All right, it's in all default positions here. So now, let's bring our oscilloscope into view. I already have it powered up here. And here's our probes. So over here, I'm going to connect the probes. Data pulse out is the red. So I suppose we can connect the ground first. That seems like it would be proper. I'll pull these covers off. Try not to lose these. All right. So here's the ground. And here is the data pulse. Now, let's have a look at what we see on the oscilloscope. We should be seeing noise. And lo and behold, we do. So let me zoom in a little bit on this because it's hard for me to see because I don't have a good angle on the scope with my head. Let's see here. There we go. All right, this is interesting. So I'm going to hit um, auto here so it can synchronize to the noise. That looks good. It's not the range yet, but I definitely saw that signal. So I think that means that the logic analyzer, uh, the data pulses are there. And if the oscilloscope picks it up, the logic analyzer should most certainly pick it up. So let's change the scale so that we could actually see the noise here. Isn't that interesting? All right, I think I have it here. It was, it was very nice of me to expand this, but that's just, you know, too much detail. What we really need to see is this one blip right here. So, I think that's about where we want it. So watch this. See that? That actually is the file on the tape. I put a very, very short file on the tape. That's it, the file's over with. Backwards, there it is again in, in reverse. Forward, reverse. It's no bigger than that. So let me change the scale here slightly. Okay, there we go. So it looks a little different than mine, but you get this, I think you get the same idea. 
every time we saw one of these, it was a, it was one of the uh, standard spacing magnetic flux transitions. Uh, let me see if I can put in a different tape that I know has lots of stuff on it. So, hang on here. Okay, so I have a good test in here. So we'll put the tape in, it'll initialize. Go stop. It's interesting why that disappears. I'm not exactly sure why, but during the initialization, I'm not so sure I care. So let's just have it go through the width of the tape, and we should see some. We should see some things here. See if I can reduce that glare, maybe. There we go. That didn't help any. There we go. So there's some there's the data. So what you see here is between here, 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 here. These are all the data pulses you're seeing. And you notice how they're kind of oscillating. They're also not perfectly in line, which is typical. So I fully expect now we will uh, hit stop and go backwards. Actually, let's go forwards. Let's test the head alignment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push on the button. I'm going to go a turn up. Two turns up. There we go. I think I just left it. Yep, right there. So what I've done is I've left the track and I've gone into the next track. So this is this is the next track. That's no track. That's one track. So what I'm doing is I'm just turning the dial and I see where one track ends and the next one begins. This might be necessary if it's a format that you don't recognize. So now going down, it takes several turns to go through a track. So basically I'm at the end of a track by default which is probably not a good place to be. You really like to be in the middle. All right, there's the end. Back up, there's the track, okay? It doesn't look like there's anything below that. So the, the manual head alignment is absolutely working. So now, let me go backwards. And uh, now we're actually gonna hook up our, now we're actually gonna hook up our um, logic analyzer and see what we get. So let's do this. So I'm going to, that tape is rewinding. I'm gonna set the scope aside, leave it hooked up. I think that's gonna be just fine. Shouldn't hurt anything. While we rewind here. So I'm going to assume that you've already watched the video for installing a Saley Logic Analyzer. And I can best help you if you use the same version I'm using. I'll send you software to that. And let's see here. So USB cable. We'll plug the USB cable in to the Logic Analyzer, which is right down here. Right down here. Very good. Okay, that's plugged in. And now, basically it says that I am connected right here. So we have connected. <clears throat> so if I were to click start, I should see noise. And so I'm going to do that here. Click start. And it's capturing. And stop and see what I, oh yeah that's noise that's exactly what that is that is the noise right there basically this is capturing the noise that we're seeing right here it's much clearer on the logic analyzer so I think this is gonna work very nicely so here's what we're gonna do I'm going to basically hit start and go And now we're into some data. So I'm going to hit stop right here, because I just saw the data come in here. I'm going to hit stop right here and see where the data begins. 
and just have a look, uh, see what it looks like here. So this, all right, now I turn the head down one turn and this looks much, much better. So this is <clears throat> entirely predicated. This is a fantastic example of how head alignment makes all the difference in the world, which is why I knew that I dare not send you anything useful without the manual track adjustment because you'll be using this a lot. And the oscilloscope will only get you close. We're gonna have to do reads, trials, and errors and probably do multiple reads and multiple tracks and then I will have my programs that run for hours and hours and hours and it figures out how to, you know, do block replacement and crazy stuff like that to try to reconstruct what might be missing. Something way, way, way beyond anything anyone ever, you know, thought was going to be necessary. But anyway, <clears throat> this now is much, much clearer. I can see this here much, much clearer. And so here's the end of the end. And this is it. The things start to look kind of really out of whack once you get to the edge of the track, up or down, which is why this is so necessary. So in this case, it's much, much cleaner. And in some cases, you know, we'll be reading the track eight times half a turn each read. Um, I just started to develop an automated process on my large one over here where an Arduino actually steps it through eight different track reads and you know it worked okay and then I ran out of time so I haven't developed it much um, and, and then you came along and I'm happy to do this for you because you're the first person to be seriously seriously interested in getting help building one of these and you're in another country which makes it super complicated and super fun. Anyway, point is, I can see this. One, 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 zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, zero. I can see it exactly. And this one I should be able to read without a single problem. Should be able to read this one without a problem at all. So let's see what we can do on this to make it, uh, to make it look good. Um, I'm going to run this through my programs and I should be able to decipher the file that I wrote on here. Again, track alignment makes all the difference and so we won't read every track to get this working right. We won't read every track just once. We might read it 5, 10, 15, 20 times and figure out exactly what the right head alignment is. And we'll need to do specific documentation of, you know, this read is this read is, you know, half a turn up. This read is one turn up. This read is two turns up or, you know, 1.5 turns up. Half half turn increments on one track is usually how I do it. And I have my own naming convention for that. You might come up with one that's better than mine, but we'll talk about that. This is, again, this is going to be a major project to do this because, um, well, no one's ever done this before. So I'm kind of the first and, and, and you're the first to test it out without me doing the whole thing here with the tapes. All right, so um, I'm gonna see if you have any questions and if you don't, I'm gonna send this thing to you and uh, we'll start the adventure together, okay? I'm pretty excited that this thing is gonna be ready to go for you. Um, one final thing I wanted to say here before I wrap this up is um, I'm gonna leave you to do um, I'm going to leave you to do the labeling here. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is right now. We have go reverse uh, uh, track bit zero one two three. I trust track bit three two one zero, and of course this is head alignment up and down, and this is engage manual head alignment right here. It's as simple as that. But learning how to use these the right way, you know, there's an art to it and you'll get there. Um, it'll be a lot of fun if you like a lot of meticulous, repetitive work and learning little things as you go along. And I'll certainly be there to help you all I can over Skype and email and whatever you need. So um, we'll go from there. Let's see what we can work out here between half a world's apart. I'm kind of excited. So we'll keep going. All right, now I just did a no-no. I unplugged this without first saving the session and I lost the data. So you always want to do a save session and you always want to save settings and data, always, and then send me the dot .logic file that this thing creates um, so that I can help you analyze it. 
you know, and eventually you'll learn to analyze these yourself, I think, but then uh, getting those programs to run on it, that's a whole other story. Visually analyzing and then turning it into ones and zeros, uh, eventually hexadecimal, which turns it into a binary file, a usable, executable file, that is a whole other story. Okay, anyway, I'm going to do this again, but I won't make you watch it. All right, Walter, this is a success. Let me show you what I've done here. I saved the uh, logic data file so we can see it in the graphic representation right here. And this just looks beautiful. Again, this was uh, one turn down on the dial from track uh, logical track zero. I instantly recognized this as a file mark, which is exactly where I expected to be because I wrote the file. Um, so, you know, it's a good it's a good baseline test. Very good baseline test. That's a bunch of spaces. Anyway, the point is, you know, looking at it, it looks good, and the um, the computer thinks it looks even better. So here's what what I what I did. Basically, I exported this by doing options. By doing options. Um, Export data, chose channel zero only, and I clicked export, and I saved this. Now, you don't have to learn how to do this. I'll do this initially for you. And then I ran my programs on it. My programs created all of these files right here, all of them. This is all of the verbose logging that my programs do to decipher every single bit of every single block on the track, and it's just a ton of data, but it's what it takes to figure out exactly what's going on here you know hours and hours but you know hey I do this for fun so anyway let's let's look at my favorite part the data block bytes report CRC verified first and foremost this is what this looks like and so basically this is my block by block report of every block uh, block of data that QIC 24 format provides here So here's a block. Let's see if I can give you the, the graphic representation of this. Yep, I can. All right. So it's hard with a certain resolution, but There's a block right there. That big white bar. This is the preamble post amble that separates blocks. So that's block one. There's block two. And there's the preamble post amble that separates block two and block three. Here's block three. And there's block four. And maybe I miscounted there, but this is the post amble. That's the end. So it's all done and all looks well. So, this my programs deciphered all of this. It turned the zeros and ones into hexadecimal, and here is my program's interpretation of the hexadecimal. So it's 512 blocks. Uh, here's the block address and the CRC. Here's the post amble, and uh, here's, the, uh, here's the CRC as it's written. Here's the CRC it was, as it was calculated according to the algorithm uh, for uh, QIC24. Track number is zero, control nimble is zero, block number is one, block sequential count is one. There are no warnings because my program thought everything was fine and the exact time stamp of the end of block one is .59179 blah 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 seconds. So, you know, the first block ended at just over half a second. Here's the second block. As you can see, that time is nearly the same point is block one, block two, block three. Here's block four. I recognize it right away. This is a this is a, um, a file mark and the fifth block is actually the same file mark repeated again which is common for QIC 24 uh, tape writers to do where they actually repeat the last block and particularly with file marks. Okay, and I won't even go into why that is, but it's something I'm very, very used to. So, notice that it has the same block number here. This is block number four as the block self-identifies, and this is block number four as the block self-identifies. However, the sequence changes because this is a fourth sequential block and this is a fifth sequential block. 
Anyway, my block bytes report tells me this. Okay, all that's fine and good. Let's get to the file. So here's the file right here. Actually, it's it's a, a dump of the entire track. So I didn't name it really well there. But the point is, I copy this and I open my hexadecimal reader here, HXD. I start a new file and I paste the hexadecimal right over here and there's the file right there. And this is exactly the text that I put in the file. And it's just a simple text file. And so if I do a file save as, and I save it as Walters test read.txt, which I've already done. I'm going to save over it again. Yes, I want to replace it. Very good. And so now I'm going to open it up and I'm going to see the file. Here it is. It's the text file that I wrote to that tape in the first place, and it is exactly three blocks long. No more, no less. And that's it. And then there's this file block mark here at the end. Um, if I do format word wrap, we'll see that is right there. And that's all normal. Uh, that actually is the file would technically end before that. So, uh, you know, when I manually reconstruct files, I manually take these things out. I just like to see them because they help denote at the end of one file and the beginning of another. The point is, it's working, Walter. I read this on the uh, tape drive that I'm sending to you, and uh, it is most definitely working. And so, I believe that we're going to be able to read things that are harder to read with this, and we'll certainly hope for the best. Figure out what the format is, figure out what any errors are on the tapes that you're having trouble reading, uh, pull the pieces out that you're able to read. We could do all kinds of fun stuff with this. So, um, especially if it's a format that I recognize. If it's not, I'll have to rewrite new programs for that new format. Uh, but, you know, that's something I kind of like to do as a project, which is why I'm really happy to be doing this with you. So, all right. Uh, looks like I'll be shipping this thing to you soon unless you have some questions. So please just let me know. And thank you.